Please visit sleepapia.org to get more videos like this one, as well as audio and blog content. Join us at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. Thanks for joining us and enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to one of our speaker series. And uh, my name is Kevin Bradley, and I'm delighted to have Teresa Schumard on board with me today for our speaker series. And we will be talking about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and also how it relates to our O2 overlap study. So thank you, Teresa, for joining me. Welcome yes. aboard again. Thank you. And Teresa, you're going to be my uh, slide expert. So that's fine. <laughs> if we could get straight into it um, and I can see the slides, we can go ahead and start. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I can have the next slide. Chronic obstructive lung disease is a progressively worsening disease. Basically what happens is when someone's diagnosed with COPD, as you're probably more familiar with the term, is it's an obstructed airflow that interferes with normal breathing and it's not fully reversible. COPD has many dominant features such as chronic bronchitis, emphysema and asthma. So basically what happens is the little airways in your lungs narrow or become blocked. This makes it even difficult to breathe and get oxygen in and out of the body. And it can also lead to lung infections as those little airways collapse, mucus can develop in it. And the whole gaseous exchange between the blood, the oxygen, the ventilation is impaired. With COPDs, the airways in your lungs also can become inflamed and thickened and the tissues where oxygen again is exchanged become destroyed. So the flow of air, like I said, in and out decreases, lowering your oxygen level. Um, and that obviously has a knock on effect on all your tissues and your organs. Um, it becomes harder to get a good deep breath. And it also become more difficult to actually expel your waste product via the gas carbon dioxide. So as the disease get worse um, or gets worse, sorry, shortness of breath makes it harder for people who suffer with COPD to become active. So we can go to the next slide. So when we did do the O2 overlap syndrome um, and study, Teresa knows a lot more about it than I do. But basically, you know, I will say is when these two conditions are combined, it creates a more unpleasant symptom of disorientated breathing, hypoventilation and oxygen desaturation. Um, and it can deteriorate into what we would call a hypoxic state meaning you're not getting enough oxygen to your vital organs and more importantly to your brain. This can actually be more increased as one sleeps at night because obviously when we sleep things slow down a little bit and if your breathing is more slower and impaired the oxygen desaturations just due to the tone in your muscles and the deep breaths that are inhibited during REM um, can lead to desaturation at nighttime. So when faced with these two conditions, PAP therapy has actually been proven to, when it's combined with low concentration of oxygen, to help alleviate some of these symptoms. So Teresa, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind bringing you in now and just discussing some of the um, studies um, and the outcomes that you guys found during the O2 overlap um, study. Yeah, sure. Um, it was a it was a great experience, and what happened was uh, they they the the study uh, was designed to look at the subset of COPD uh, patients that had been living with OSA, and maybe they were a little bit. CPAP naive because some of them had not had any education or had any um, interactions with anybody about the machine. So they were 
you know, dealing with their COPD and now they were dealing with their OSA and trying to treat it. And some people just weren't using it correctly or they weren't, you know, use it. So, so what happened was curriculum was developed so that we would take these patients and put them uh, in front of some modules of, of information that are just basic, you know, what is OSA, what is oxygen, how do you put your oxygen on through your CPAP, you know, things like that, that uh, were pretty fundamental, but yet if somebody was naive to CPAP, then they, they would need a little extra help. So um, we wanted to prove that there were, you know, going to be better outcomes and there, there were. Um, I won't go into all the numbers and everything, but it was quite a large undertaking. We had healthcare professionals and peers of uh, COPD slash OSA or what we called O2 overlap, overlap syndrome. Um, and we sort of took them and coached them along the way with the peers and the modules. And at the end of, at the end of it, after they spoke with their peers and with the healthcare professionals, uh, and they did their uh, their curriculum, and they they looked at all that. They at the end were uh, surveyed and talked to again, like, "How was your experience? How are you doing now? Are you doing better?" And it, it was just amazing, you know, how many people had improved and their usage improved. You know, people that weren't wearing their CPAP all of a sudden were successful in wearing their CPAP. So we were very happy about it and we're very happy to participate. Yeah, you know, and it, it sort of makes me think about some of the population out there when we look at our awake group or our Facebook pages. And some people have complained of feeling like they're suffocating at night when they're adhering to their um, therapy or the mask isn't sitting properly and they're feeling the pressure's too high. So if you, you can imagine, some, some people with COPD feel like that nearly all the time. So maybe when they actually get the therapy, when they have the positive airway pressure with a little bit of oxygen to help them along, it, it would most likely help their situation during um, the nighttime when, again, as I said, the tone of the muscles in the body relaxes, making breathing shallow anyway. You know, so we will discuss a little bit about, you know, positions and how people um, get over that at night when they're experiencing this. But anything else to add with that, Teresa, before we go to the next slide? Well, just that it, we found a funny little thing that we didn't expect. There were some people that were in the study that were using their CPAP in the daytime. Not that they were sleeping in the daytime, but they wanted to put it on it. It gave them some sort of relief. And this was anecdotal. This was, you know, I don't have any... Uh, numbers to show you but i know just being you know involved in it that that was sort of a uh, cherry on top of the sunday you know that that somebody was finding some relief from their cpap in the daytime now maybe they were watching wow. tv i don't know i don't know what the you know all the details were but i just i thought that was pretty nice you know yeah. to hear yeah interesting that's good Good. Again, and maybe it speaks to that positive pressure, just making it feel like it's airy. Just and opening that airway and, yeah. up. Yes, oh, yeah. yes. Good. Okay, well, we can go to some of the things that um, can cause COPD. If we take the, to the next slide, please. So before we hit that, actually, sorry, the, the prevalence of COPD is estimated to be around 32 million people in the USA. Um, it is looked at as one of the, you know, these things change all the time, but current research that I had seen, it was um, quoted as being most likely the fourth leading cause of death. Now, this is a little bit controversial. I, I did see a couple of controversial or contradicting, should I say, information regarding 
the prevalence in women versus men. I seem to see more um, pointing to women were um, at higher risk. And I think it's because they were misdiagnosed before. And, um, but certainly anything I did read looked at the fact that maybe women had, um, were more likely to suffer from COPD than men. Um, and it does occur predominantly in individuals over the age of 40. Um, and um, that's just sort of that progressive decline in the disease um, that usually um, shows itself as, as we um, age over 40. Okay, so you know the, the primary risk factor, factor sorry, is smoking, um, and I think people are familiar with that risk. Um, it's estimated that 50% of lifelong smokers will develop um, COPD. Secondhand smoke can also contribute to about 20% of the cases in COPD. Um, however, now we're seeing that become less as stricter controls and smoking in public places, for example, or are, you know, um, fraud upon and, and it's not the same as years ago where bars, restaurants, cinemas <laughs> everywhere, you know, one could smoke. Um, so that number should decline. But again, um, obviously, the big risk factor is um, smoking itself. Occupational hazards can account for, you know, 10 to 15% of cases. And that's anything from maybe somebody being exposed to, you know, air pollution as well, or, you know, something in their um, occupation that may expose them to chemicals or, you know, some sort of gas that mm -hmm. over the years can decline in their lung function. And then their genetics do play a little part in this and it does occur or, you know, the research I'd looked at, it says it accounts, sorry, for maybe one to 5% of the population. So, you know, when we look at going back to air pollution, this actually was interesting because it was more a factor in developing countries. And it's not just the actual air, you know, in our, you know, environment, it can also be you know, our environment within our homes, uh, meaning that some people are still using coal or wood burning stoves to cook and um, without very good ventilation can lead to, um, you know, smoke building up that they're inhaling and obviously then leads to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease as the exposure to that continues. So if we go to the next slide and you know, like we've alluded to the fact that the the primary symptom in, in COPD is shortness of breath or dyspnea, as it's also referred to. It's the most common, common and most distressing um, and debilitating for the person. And again, it's that feeling that they just can't get enough air into their lungs. Um, air can also get trapped in the lungs and they can't fully expire in their last breath. And this sometimes, you know, years ago, we used to say that people with COPD maybe had like a barrel type chest. And it's just that constant hyperinflation of the lungs that can cause that. You know, like anybody who's ever suffered through a bad cold or cough or COPD itself, a chronic cough can be exhausting for the person. And in this situation with COPD, it's usually productive, um, especially in the morning. Um, and sputum production can be anywhere from clear to yellow or green or brown, depending on um, the condition or as it worsens or if there's infection on board. And again, like I spoke to about earlier, dyspnea or shortness of breath can lead to just a low tolerance of activity and exercise, which in turn can lead to muscle wasting, which actually is associated with um, poor outcomes. So I think if anybody's out there listening to this and they actually have COPD, you may have heard like, you know, there's some periods where you have an exacerbation of this illness. And that can be an acute exacerbation is more defined as an increase in the shortness of breath. So it can lead to confusion, disorientation. Um, people actually, you know, have more, of course, increased sputum production with a change from clear to maybe green or yellow, like we said. 
And some people at night, um, it can lead to what we would refer to as orthopnea. So basically, if you imagine like you're suffocating almost, or you feel like you're suffocating, when you lay down flat at night to go to, to sleep, it just actually feels worse. And um, it feels like you're drowning almost. So the orthopnic position for people that they usually adapt to is basically they get more comfort at night by propping themselves up in bed with three or four pillows. So they're actually trying to get to sleep, almost sitting semi recumbent um, in an upright position. Um, and this can just help with, um, you know, the, the breathing itself. Um, most people gain a little bit of relief during that position when they're sleeping at night. Um, and again, you know, people have um, greater difficulty trying to get to sleep if they're coughing constantly, if they can't clear out their lungs, or again, if they feel like they're suffocating despite the fact that they may be using PAP and oxygen. Uh, exacerbation, again, can also lead to cyanosis, which, you know, is like blue tinged lips or skin. And that's just basically the lack of oxygen that's getting to the vital organs and tissues. Okay. So when we look at management of, of um, COPD, I mean, the idea of that is there's, you know, try and treat the symptoms. There is no cure and it's a progressive disease. The main thing that you most likely, you know, will be told if you do smoke is stop. And, you know, it's always a good idea to seek help when you're embarking on smoking sensation or cessation, sorry. There's better outcomes for that when you do um, join a group, for example, um, become part of a program, and maybe use nicotine supplements or replacements. Um, and, and, you know, again, the, the higher uh, success rate is foretold in that. A lot of people as well, you know, feel like light exercise is good, even though it's really difficult to do. But again, it just helps, you know, with muscle tone. It helps, you know, with your whole well-being. And um, some of that is actually brought into, I'll come back to this a little bit, but it comes into more with the chest physio as well. So, uh, you know, I know a particular patient that had chest physio every two or three days, and it just helped drain out those airways in the lungs that were getting blocked and narrowed. Um, and secretions would build up. So it helped them expel that out um, and actually help cough some of the gunk that was in there, which um, in turn led to them breathing a little bit better and not feeling like they were suffocating. Medication wise is, you know, usually with bronchodilators can help dilate those airways. And in some instances as well, um, you know, we, we they can use, um, a lot of the times, um, Ventolin inhalers, just to again, open up the airways in conjunction with steroids. So if we look at this disease as well, you know, the, the diagnosis is usually people come into a doctor's office just complaining of shortness of breath or lack of air or feeling like they're suffocating. Some of the, you know, higher grade testing can be, you know, even a chest x-ray may show um, hyperinflation or airways that are, you know, have got um, secretions in them. They may actually send a patient for pulmonary function tests where they can see how well um, under stress or even an exercise tolerance test with pulse oximetry um, to see that if someone is actually exercising, can they maintain their oxygen saturations or does it drop because they're not getting that gaseous exchange? Spirometric, spirometry, sorry, <laughs> spirometer <laughs> or spirometry can be as simple as, you know, we in hospitals, there's something called an incentive spirometer. And a lot of people that may have had surgery will see it's something you even just take a deep breath and blow into and you get a reading to say, this is your lung capacity. And, um, you know, it encourages someone to deep breathe and clear out their airways, but it can also be an indication that your capacity for your lungs is um, impaired. 
excuse me, arterial blood gases are usually done just to actually um, give a different, um, or not a different diagnosis. It can actually say, is there a differential diagnosis between the COPD or is the breathlessness caused by something like heart failure or pneumonia that's currently happening or something else? So if you get that arterial blood gas, you'll be able to tell what the oxygen level is and what the carbon dioxide level is. And people with COPD have a higher carbon dioxide level because they're actually retaining that. They're not expelling that waste out through their um, exhalation. Okay. So if we go to the next slide, then we can look at sometimes if we are online and we talk about this, please do feel free to ask questions. I think it's very important as well. And I've read some um, hospitals that I've looked at for research for people suffering with COPD. And of course, what we see too, people suffer, suffering with um, sleep apnea, sorry. Support and peer support is key in some situations like this. And again, some people feel like they're isolated. They're the only one. They want to seek help. They're not sure if their symptoms are typical or not. And how do you overcome symptoms? What to do? So, you know, I'm a big advocate of peer-to-peer -peer support. And, you know, it may be an idea that if you are diagnosed um, with COPD, to seek out help in some groups that may be associated with your local hospital. So anything to add, Teresa? I, I think that you've covered it all. Uh, I, I do encourage people to find that support on a local level and you know with COVID maybe that's not a possibility right now I don't know uh, you'd have to look in your local area but uh, there are online groups and support just look them up sure good if, on our website we have some resources i was going to say well. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah and that's always a good place to start and then reach out through our uh, facebook groups and website to actually you know get information and also ask questions from other people that may be going through something that you're going through as well so i hope that's been helpful for um those that are suffering with us um with copd and um Hopefully, um, again, you're getting the treatment you need and um, let us know if we can be of any help during our presentation and surely um, send us some questions and we'll be happy to respond. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Teresa. It's always a pleasure. Mine Take care. as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just $50 can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleepapnea.org slash donate for details. The ASAA is a patient-focused organization. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page, join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or sleepapnea.org and you can join the conversation. It's all free.